Good evening and welcome. My name is Igor Marjanovic and I have a great privilege to serve as the Dean of the Rice School of Architecture and also uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to uh, tonight's lecture, uh, which is the annual LDS Lecture for Innovative Practice in Architecture, an important lecture uh, that is sponsored by uh, our alum and friends, friend of the program, Randir Sunny and his wife and partner, Sunila. Randir is a graduate of our program and also principal of Llewellyn Davis Sunny uh, here uh, in, in Houston. Uh, Randir and Sunila, would you please stand up so you can be recognized for your amazing support for the School of Architecture. Randir is also a member of the William Ward Watkin Advisory Council for the School of Architecture, and uh, he's also joined tonight with other council members here uh, who will be participating in the council session tomorrow morning. So if I can please ask the Watkin Council members, all of them, to please stand up and also be recognized, that'll be great. The Watkin Council is an important group of friends and supporters of the school, and they help not only provide advice, but also support for everything that we do here uh, in the School of Architecture. It is also my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, tonight um, Lyndon Neri, who is also co-founder and principal of Neri and Hu uh, in Shanghai, China, a firm uh, that's an award-winning practice that uh, they, he co-founded with Rosanna Hu in 2004. Um, the firm has beautiful, I would say even stunning projects, which I'm sure he will share uh, some of them tonight. Um, and they integrate design, wellness, and health on the one hand with the timeless aspects of architecture, in particular how architecture operate, operates in a particular cultural context uh, and historical context, playing with the ideas of historical memory, typology, and even nostalgia as well. I really appreciate the way that they're dedicated to the fundamentals of architecture and architecture's experience of inhabiting, moving through, and experiencing uh, the buildings as well. Through their work, I think they celebrate architecture that is beautiful and simple without really being simplistic. Speaking of beautiful practices, uh, the after Lindon's talk, we will be joined over here by our colleague, Carlos Jimenez, uh, who will be providing brief remarks uh, to Lindon's lecture tonight and also kick off the first question of the evening and then from there on moderate the Q&A session as well. So without much more ado, please join me in welcoming Lindon Neri here to Rice Architecture. Thank you. This microphone is very sensitive. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Igor, for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me to your school. Uh, I have heard so much about this program uh, and have the privilege to teach many of the RISE students, um, both at the master's program at Harvard and Yale uh, that have matriculated from here. Uh, I would argue they're probably some of the best students um, behind Berkeley. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you wonder why. Uh, I believe a number of us that went to Berkeley would agree. Um, and I did that because I have support. So my, the title of my talk today will be Grounded on the Idea of Thresholds. Before I delved into the subject of my lecture, let me show you where we are from, the place where we practice. This is our home, Shanghai, and this is our office. Let me start this lecture by quoting literary critic and Shakespearean uh, scholar Terence Hawkes, who once said, the true nature of things may be said to lie not in things themselves, but in the relationships which we construct and then perceive between them. The notion of traversing between space, time, and practice has long been embedded in Nirn Hu's architectural practice. A current exhibition of the studio's, studio's work in the Aedes Gallery in Berlin, which just came down about a month ago, um, showed 17 years uh, of work in progress. The lecture will examine a series of contemporary issues in various global contexts uh, and aims to shed light on how the firm grounds its work. I know a lot of you that came to me today wanted me to show this project, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's one of our latest projects and I'm not showing it. 
Um, a lot of people ask tough question already before I even start my lecture, so I was like, wow, this is a tough crowd. Uh, this is an extension to a memorial museum in the Western Hotel in the ancient city of Xi'an, famous for the terracotta warriors, showing that our work not only crossed between locations, cultures, but also between typologies. While maintaining an intellectual inquiry into adaptive reuse and the role of history in reimagined spatial legibility associated with voyeurism, tectonics, and the use of poche, a search for connection back to the vernacular. Uh, this is a project, uh, a new headquarter for a pastry factory uh, in Beijing. And of course, the role of collective memory, as Igor has uh, mentioned, reflective nostalgia, ruins, and fragments. This is a furniture store uh, in the city of Shanghai that was built uh, 12 years ago. We use the title Thresholds because we find that we are always working with the ideas of the in-between. Interestingly enough, programmatically, even with our client, this is a small pizza restaurant owned by a Parisian with a, f a fairly famous Japanese chef. Um, and the brief um, was, was quite uh, strange uh, in that he made it clear that when people come in, uh, people need to experience not only pizza, but the idea of what it is to be a Parisian, but at the same time, the sensibility of a Japanese. So you can imagine uh, how twisted that is as a brief. Um, and of course, I just said yes, despite the fact that I have an agenda. Thresholds with different variations, often crossing divides that, tra that tradition, institution, society, or even what our profession has predetermined. The obvious divide, you can say, are past, future, east, west, global, local, urban, rural, interior, exterior. But other more nuanced divides, we feel, have over the years become themes that help us analyze our own projects. And in fact, today, I'll be organizing my talk using those themes to describe many of our projects. Unfortunately, this will not be shown, so I decided to at least give it the one minute of glory it deserves. This is a theater project we did about seven years ago. As a practice, this place we call home, Shanghai or China, sets the stage for our design explorations. This is also the title of our second monograph, Threshold, Space, Time, and Practice. The entry of the office became the cover of our new monograph, published last year by Thames and Hudson. In fact, um, one of the foreword, aside from Rafael Maneo, was uh, the former dean, uh, Sarah Whiting. Uh, I promise, Igor, you will, I will ask you to contribute next time. Um, this is what I called awkward moment. Then, anyways, uh, <laughs> before moving to those projects, <laughs> let me set the context of where we work and explain a few key concepts for you to understand the idea, ideas behind each final design. Forgive the oversimplification and generalization, but due to time, I won't be able to go too deeply into any one of them. Many of our work respond to the ever-pressing problem in China related to the broader subject of sustainability and restoration, often discussed in terms of urban or adaptive reuse. Since 1990, one out of six families in China have been evicted and relocated. Our office was a big victim of this about five years ago. Uh, they just gave us three weeks of notice. Imagine we have uh, a whole office in operation and we were asked to move. So we had to rent a place and really scramble. The intense development over the last 20 years has forced a city like Shanghai to confront with the aftermaths of demolition, the er erasure of traditional urban and cultural fabric. Notice this is the exact time period we have been living and working in the city of Shanghai. While the city must develop rapidly, we seek to find alternative modes to design and build. If you look at the image here to the left, we enter into a related but more complex issue of architecture as a means of cultural production and identity. Left is Michael Wolff's uh, photo uh, photography, a German uh, uh, photographer based in Hong Kong. In this photograph uh, that represents this anonymous urbanization, for those of you that know um, Asia, obviously this is Hong Kong, uh, but for many of us, it could be mistaken as Bangkok or even Shanghai. On the right is a typical Shanghai lane house, unique in character and rich in tradition. The dichotomy of modernity and tradition seems to be contrasting opposites, but maybe, there's a coexisting balance between the two extremes, like this bronze lion facing the demolition 
and this, the block that's about to be, the, to be demolished and the new building that's beyond. This is a film from Jia Zhangke uh, titled, I Wish I Knew. Architects like us wish we knew the answers, but like the film's magnificent scenery, when faced with loss and destruction, we often retro, uh, retreat back to nostalgia. Nostos in Greek means homecoming, and algos means pain or ache. Nostalgia, therefore, can be understood as a longing for home to the point of deep pain. Architecturally, it is like our desire to preserve a historical building or city, to be frozen in time. All of my three kids uh, were raised um, in Shanghai, so you can imagine every year some of their favorite places, be it uh, ice cream place or tea uh, places, would just disappear appear in the face uh, of our neighborhood. This is appalling. So in many ways, there's this yearning like the Acropolis or the Xi'an terracotta warriors when we have a tendency to want to preserve everything. Is that right? We don't know. So perhaps through Svetlana Boim's writing, we can get a hint of the possibilities of how to deal with nostalgia. She wrote extensively about this in The Future of Nostalgia, and she called this type of attitude for pres preservation, restorative nostalgia, a literal reconstruction of the lost home. Another way to think about nostalgia, which we prefer, is reflective nostalgia, which is more a longing for home. Even if you may ar never arrive at home, but it's okay because in the process, something innovative and creative happens. Perhaps it's not so straight, perhaps it's not so linear, perhaps it's through the interstitial spaces, the third space that Homi Baba coined uh, in many of his writing, that we find true meaning and essence of what home is. That's one of the concepts that we deal with. Second, I wanna talk about ruins. Speaking of past history, we find that reflective nostalgia has an uncanny similarity to the Eastern idea of ruins, very different from that of the West. The English word for ruin originated in the idea of falling, like fallen stones, and on the left is Roman ruins of the Forum. This material of stones, fallen stone, is what makes the ruins and creates the romantic notion of ruins as a visual aesthetic. But if we turn to the right image, a painting by Shi Tao, in his Yellow Mountain series, that material remnant is missing in this painting about ruins. No building or stones are present anywhere. Whereas the Chinese notion of ruins is less overtly tied to visual remnants, it is instead evoked through absence and voids. And here, the imagery of ancient tree, rather than building, symbolizes both death, decay, as well as rebirth. Digging further, we find that the earliest term used for ruins in Chinese is the character chiu, meaning a mound of rubble. Not a building, but a mound of rubble, denoting the ruined site. This is not just a Chinese phenomena, it's also a Japanese um, sensibility. During the Eastern Zhou period, Xu replaced the term for ruins. Whereas Chiu refers to a topographic feature, Xu is primarily a signifier of emptiness. So if you look at this image, to the right is an example of Chiu, the remains of a palace in Sanxi province from the third century. Shown here next to Tintern Abbey, considered a perfect ruin by Thomas Watley in 1772, where the original structure is visible and the erosion is identifiable and romantic. Unlike European architectural ruins, Chinese ruins no longer convey the original grandeur. The superstructures have disappeared leaving only foundations in the form of rubble. The Chinese concept of ruin is dependent on this notion of er erasure and void, resulting from the absence of the original. You might say, well, that Western romantic aesthetic, or as Regal would theorize, its age value seems to be in a lot of Chinese visual memory too, in the image of Ab. But in fact, it is somewhat manufactured by the West. Like these two images, they both portray Chinese decay structures, but they were produced in Italy and France. In fact, from the fifth century BC to the mid 19th century AD, only five or six artworks in China depicted ruined buildings. 
This was an interesting revelation on our part about six, seven years ago when art historian uh, Wu Hong's research uh, from University of Chicago came out, uh, which was quite an interesting um, revelation for both Rosanna and myself. What does this mean? It means that the concept of ruin in China being an internal, internalized concept and not the romantic aesthetic that we have learned in art history. If you were to look at this particular image, um, it's also Shi Tao's uh, Qingliang's Terrace, he shows no trace of damaged architecture, even if the inscription is about broken roofs and ruined entrenchment. The image and the poem are freed from one another, playing different roles in their representation. But although the visual culture is absent from history, and there's no such artistic tradition showing a destroyed city or a man looking at the destroyed city, there is a deep and strong lamentation of the past in poetry that confirms this internalization. I'm not saying one is better than the other. All I'm saying is that there's a different way of lo looking at um, ruins. And in many ways, ruins uh, from an Eastern uh, perspective are profoundly internalized um, as seen in the literary tradition through uh, the genre huai, huai gu poetry. I spent time on the two insight, namely reflective nostalgia and their internalized notion of ruins because they inspired us to look at the past differently and gave us alternative strategies to reconfigure historic remnants. And I know this is an architecture school, so I know some of you probably says, I, I'm, I'm not interested in so much history, Lyndon, so I'm going to projects, okay? Um, so the first project I'll be showing is technically our first architectural work. We did mostly interiors for the first five uh, years uh, before this opportunity was presented to us 12 years ago. Um, even though it is a familiar and old project, I've included in this lecture because I think it sets the stone for the subject of thresholds and urban reuse. It was on the South Bund. We got a call uh, from two partners. Uh, one was from Singapore and one was sh Shanghai. And I was really excited when given the opportunity, thinking we were given the opportunity to transform one of the 33 majestic buildings facing on the Bund. The phone call was, are you interested in doing a project on the bun? Many of you that have been to Shanghai, that's the bun I know. Well, this was the building I inherited. I forgot, he said, south of the bun. So this is what we got. Imagine my shock. But I was even more shocked when the client proceeded to ask me if you can tear this down and turn it into Mayfair, London. And I said to myself, oh, this is absolutely crazy, but I've never done architecture b before that. Well, I, I worked as an architect, but as a practice, we were doing mostly interiors up until then. And so I was not about to let this go. So in many ways, I started telling the client that it would be cheaper to save this building. Obviously, I was lying, but um, you have to do everything in your power as an architect to do whatever you do. So all your presentation here in school, you need another layer uh, of, of sets of stools to, to deal with the practical world, world. So this original army building was initially slated uh, to be demolished, uh, both by the planning board, by the client, and they had assumed that it would be a lot easier to build from ground up, which to a certain extent I agree with them, rather than to work with this, what they called unsightly industrial remnant. This project started with a building that was meant completely to be uh, a sense of tabula rasa. But we realized that with their budget, there was absolutely no way we could even uh, remotely meet their 20-room hotel and all the other restaurants that was needed. Um, so what we did was we started looking at all the patina and all the um, details that were in this particular um, remnant of an industrial remnant, and we thought, Maybe this is worth keeping. That, mind you, this was about 14 years ago, and the preservation culture in Shanghai was very much in the restorative, nostalgic vein that I had described by Sebet Lena Boim. We started sketching away at the possible. I know this is different from what it is now. Um, and managed to convince the client that this was the cheaper alternative, despite our ulterior motive. Um, in fact, 
there was no addi additional story up above. I still remember the presentation was already done. And then I realized, oh, where's my architecture? I decided to add three rooms up above with a rooftop. And I remember the mother of the client coming to the presentation and goes, oh, that's a beautiful idea. <laughs> There's a view. And the client goes, oh, Lyndon, you can't be, you can't do this to me. I'm going to add another million, a million and a half just to build this. And the mother goes, I will take care of it. So I was like, amazing. So I was not lucky all the time. So the architectural concept behind our renovation rests on a clear contrast of what is old and new. The main entrance takes you to an interior lobby, which is expressed through both a blurring of the interior and exterior, as well as between the public and the private realms, creating a disorienting yet refreshing journey. We saw this as providing a uniquely Shanghai experience for the traveler who is not looking for a universal encounter. Uh, we convinced the client that you know, tourists is good, but if they have a checklist of where they have to go to in Shanghai, then they're really not your client. How crazy of me to say that, really naive. Um, but what was interesting was my, my parents came and visited this, and my mom and my dad couldn't stop laughing. They were just shocked uh, beyond belief. In fact, my mom says, Lyndon, can I ask you, uh, is this project complete? And I said, um, he, he used my Chinese name, not Lyndon, but uh, he says, is this complete? I said, yes, it is. And he says, second question, did the client pay you in full? Uh, I said, yes, <laughs> yes, he did. So he said, well, it's either you're really brilliant or the client's really stupid. I said, mom, don't say that, he's behind you. Um, so, but, but e even uh, the um, tourism board uh, and the planning board didn't find this too funny. In fact, they thought we were making a mockery uh, of the whole preservation. It took another two years until David, uh, David Beckham uh, decided to rent the whole hotel that the tourism board came running to our office and said, oh, you might know something. Let's put your hotel in the front of our tourism board brochure. Right? It's amazing how it takes a, a, a soccer star to affirm what we do. Uh, just very sad, but that's what we do as architects. Um, so these visual connection of unexpected spaces not only bring an element of surprise, but also force the guests to confront the local urban condition, which is prevalent in all the lane houses in Shanghai. If you've been to uh, lane houses in Shanghai, this is a real condition. I live in one of them. I have been a modernist myself. My bathroom has this big, gigantic window, and sometimes I forget to uh, pull the shade down and uh, ante across the street, cooking or across, uh, three meters away from me would look at me and I'm like, oh God, I'm butt naked. Um, and, and you know, I, I, that afternoon she would say, you've gained weight. I'm like, oh, this is great, right? But this is a real condition. And so we thought, what if, what if the traveler comes and have this experience throughout the whole uh, space? So we slit the restaurant, have openings um, that look up through the slits and you see the, a pair of bedroom interior windows uh, up above. Um, it's from the restaurant. You'd be standing here in your bedroom, looking down at the restaurant through the slit above the dining room uh, that we just saw. Uh, here one bedroom looks into the adjacent room. Uh, a real uh, transparency. Of course you could pull the curtain down, but I realized that a lot of parents with kids really love this configuration. Uh, you know, the tiger mom in all the Asian moms. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, the sectional qualities very much like the lane houses are prevalent everywhere. Using part of the existing wood roof structure, uh, we then managed to keep them and made them into louvers. Uh, the other point is a dialogue between the interior. Uh, exterior, you see a lot of sort of this relationship. Uh, this is the cheapest room because it's literally uh, above the reception, the check encounter. counter, imagine. Uh, you pay your, your bill and you're like, yeah, that's your room above. Uh, very efficient. So we made visual connection of unexpected spaces, not only to help one discover and explore, but also getting lost. Keeping the existing stair, um, those existing stairs sectionally, there were three, some of them lead you to nowhere. Um, quite interestingly enough, this was a warehouse apparently for illegal drugs at one point. 
um, and naturally it's, it, it makes a lot of sense to have all these different stairs that lead you to nowhere. So when cops come, they will get confused and be lost as well, right? So we thought that story was interesting, so we kind of kept this. And I told the client this would be perfect artwork for you. And um, they said, yeah, that's a good idea. So here it is, uh, mid-air, some of them. So this project recomposed memories of the city that would have otherwise been demolished. So we have made a conscious effort um, the last 10 years to document our projects uh, with videos to bring about the spatial qualities and architecture that we are interested in, but at the same time allow people who do not have an opportunity to travel to the place where we practice or the projects where we are to experience our projects. Not perfect, um, not the same as um, the real architect, uh, architecture, but um, at least it gives you that idea. One of the um, best compliment I got uh, was from David Chipperfield when he said, I've seen your video, I've seen your drawings, I've seen your photograph, but in real life, it's even better. I was like, wow, that's the best compliment I can uh, get from someone like him. In Nirn, whose adaptive reuse projects, the ruin operates as the muse, whose power is to elicit visceral experiences to create a connection to the past. However, the basis for adaptive reuse and even some of the seemingly ground up projects, which you will see later, more often than not are actually non-romantic relics from the past. The muse in question does not always follow a conventional set of aesthetics, nor value assignation. They may not have any historical value at all, or may even be abandoned structures resulting from a failed development. In fact, in many of our newer projects, very much like how Lakaton Vassal would approach their projects, we have convinced clients to keep many of their failed projects and hopefully transform some of these remnants, some of them industrial, some of them not even that significant, uh, in order to maximize uh, what's already been used. I also like film because then I can rest. So what's interesting is um, as a multidisciplinary practice, uh, we made a lot of the furniture. In fact, many of our new, a lot of the furnitures that are now carried by um, a lot of the European brands started in this uh, particular project. I started in the rooms and many of the brands uh, when they came and visited um, said, is this taken? Uh, interesting question. And actually, um, there were about eight brands uh, that took many of the pieces from here, from the restaurants uh, to the bedrooms, um, even the hardware uh, that we've designed for intro. We've also introduced a set of, um, you see the markings over there, not just quotes, but also um, our favorite restaurants in the city. Unfortunately, this hotel uh, closed during COVID. Very sad for me. Uh, technically, my first baby, or architectural baby. So the second project uh, goes back to my hometown, which is uh, quite interesting. Well, not quite my hometown, about an, uh, uh, an hour away, uh, which is in Futo. The project draws inspiration from imagery uniquely associated with Futo, the Jingsan Temple. In the album Fuzhou and the River Min, which documented his legendary journey up the Min River, Thompson captured the ancient structure in its original state, resting serenely above a floating rock in 1871. This would become a lasting image identified with the city of Fuzhou, where our next project is situated. This is a rare example of temple structure built in the middle of a river in China. John Thompson was one of the first photographers ever to travel to the country and provide Western audiences with some of the first glimpse into the Far East. Professor Wu 
also cites Thompson's work as those images that gave the world the first visuals of a possibility of ruined buildings in China, since they were absent from traditional paintings. So the client's brief was rather simple. The challenge was to create an enclosure for this wooden structure and make it into a tea house. You could imagine this uh, uh, wooden structure. Um, it was apparently of a high-ranking Qing dynasty. As how true that is, I don't know. It was relocated from Anhui, so I start to wonder, really, can it be possible for, uh, from the Qing dynasty? Um, but, you know, in China, there's a lot of experts, so I can't question the expert, especially if you want a project. So, uh, and we were asked to enshrine it as, an, as the inhabitable center piece of a new tea house. So in initially, the first month of our project, we already had a scheme. And it was last minute, the chairman loved this tea house and says, well, can you just put it inside your building. I'm like, no, I've got to restart my design. And so we redid the design. Um, he played a little bit of an extra fee, but not much. Uh, so this project illustrates contentment wherein the original ruin structure dating back to the Qing Dynasty is treated as a precious artifact around which a new building is erected to house. Physically contained in this new structure, the relationship between new and old structures, one of contrast, but also uh, it complements one another. The entire building is conceived of as a relic shelter, an enclosure that enshrines the architectural ruin as an object on display. The significance of the original relic is reinforced by the floor plan. Um, that should have been Poche, which also reflects the idea of uh, this contentment. So the project as a house atop a rock, based on that uh, Thompson photograph, uh, obviously became very important to us. The tea house is elevated above the ram concrete base, and the co copper roof echoes the roof line of the enclosed um, relic. The old structure, as you can see from the slit, is nested in the interior of the building, surrounded by a new he heavy carved base structure of ram concrete. So you see that slit. Um, when you enter, you actually see the old uh, in relationship to the new. Upon entering, you are confronted with this old relic. Um, this is the first floor. Uh, in, in order to mitigate uh, some of the program uh, condition, we start using copper wire mesh to start wrap, wrapping around it like walls, uh, and yet to give it that transparency so the structure of the old will not be compromised. Only upon reaching the mezzanine does the structural configuration of the building begin to reveal itself. The hovering metal roof is lifted above the solid base to introduce a continuous illumination around its periphery. The mezzanine space allows one to see intricate details of the relic structure at eye level. Spaces such as the mezzanine along with other interstitial passages are examples of hybrid zones where one side is an old structure and the another side is the new wall of containment. This actually became the cover of the last issue of Damas, uh, not last issue, but last year's issue when guest editor Jean Novel asked, are we entitled to modify the past? The best basement level includes a secondary arrival lo uh, level, um, which became the rotunda, a sunken courtyard, um, and had all the tea tasting rooms. At the top of the rotunda, there is this carved oculus capped by a skylight and submerged beneath the pool in the courtyard above. It filters the sun through a thin, thin veil of water, and then when you stand below, you see this mesmerizing play uh, of reflection. Let me see if, if the video plays. So the act of containment is instinctively understood in architecture as a means to enclose and shelter. To contain something implies that a certain boundary, border, or perimeter is first drawn to demarcate a space. Containment is related to a desire to reinforce an object's status and celebrate its existence by protecting and shielding. When an object is contained, it has the ability to retain its own objecthood while still coexisting, even subsumed into a larger extended framework.
for some of you that are probably wondering, and there was this uh, question today as to having some of our project with um, amazing material with good budget uh, and very little program, uh, this is that, uh, I have to admit. Uh, this is one of those loophole within the Chinese real estate uh, governance wherein if you want a higher FAR, for some of you that are students, I'm sure you know floor area ratio, um, you should give back um, a cultural component to the government. If you do that, your FAR can grow by a particular percentage. And of course, by now, the museum was not allowed. Because you can imagine, in China, everyone's doing a museum precisely because they want um, higher FAR. Uh, and in this case, they ran out of ideas, no museum, so tea house. And um, surprisingly, it became so popular uh, that the client actually now, um, uh, two tea brands actually have offered to buy this uh, project outright and make it really public. And of course, uh, he want, him wanting to keep it um, decided um, that he will operate himself. But technically, this should be public and can't be uh, for profit. So in contrast to containment, uh, the next project, Yangzhou Retreat, uses dispersion both as a material experience and spatial organization. The main material strategy integrates new with old by utilizing reclaimed bricks to build new walls to create a wellness retreat compound. This is the site we were given next to the slender Westlake um, in Yangzhou. The program was to design a 20-room wellness retreat. The site has been dilapidated for a very, or left for a very long time. Before starting, we went to Yangzhou, of course, and studied some of the vernacular conditions. Uh, there were traditional clusters of courtyards, and some hybrid transformations through the years resulted uh, from functional needs and variations. Um, we walked around the city and um, we visited uh, this uh, nearby relic, an important garden called Guyuan. Um, some of you might know this uh, project. Uh, interesting, this was owned by a salt merchant. Uh, the garden is uh, on top and there's this uh, grid of uh, clusters of courtyard. Uh, Guyuan is a private garden. Um, he was extremely rich. Uh, some would argue he was also a district mayor during that time. And like many other Chinese classical gardens, Guyan is a manifestation of the Taoist ideal of being one with nature. Um, what was interesting is these walls that were the passageway also became the firewall that divides uh, the different courtyards. And in many ways, this became the most memorable feature uh, from our visit, uh, which became um, a conceptual foundation for the project. Um, and you can kind of see some of these typological uh, moments that interest us. Going back to our site, uh, you can imagine seeing all this beautiful thing and coming in here, my first instinct was, okay, well, water house, I would not demolish, but this really is just nothing to keep. And yet, strangely, the vice mayor goes, no, you have to keep this because you're very good at keeping things. And I'm like, God, that's really bad. Sometimes you have a reputation, now you're asked to do exactly uh, what you have to do in sort of a, a repetitive manner. And actually the design brief uh, from the mayor, not the owner, uh, was to um, keep the footprint of what was there. Not so much the building, but the footprint. And he says, I will be watching you. And now, the client was quite a visionary. Uh, he believes restor restoration should not only be in major cities like the Great Wall and the Summer Palace uh, in Beijing, or the Jing'an Temple in Shanghai, or even Tulo in Xiamen. Those are the obvious ones. He argues there's a lot of other sceneries that are equally important, one of them being the Slender Lake in Yangzhou. And um, he argues that if we don't revive this, then the rural condition having all the younger generations uh, live uh, the rural area will slowly die. So you can see the existing um, as built uh, site plan and you can see we were scratching our head, how are we gonna regulate this? So we thought, oh, I have an idea. What if we use the idea of Guyan and the idea of this, we impose a grid, okay, it's not Mishan grid, but uh, to give not an order, uh, but using it as a connector to tie the buildings together. 
forming a network of fortified walls and covered walkways. And so this is where we came, and you can kind of see the buildings are not aligned, but the walkways are. Um, from this aerial view, you see a clear ortho orthogonal orientation. Uh, the planning uh, department was really pleased uh, because we met all their uh, mandate. Um, so as a strategy, the covered walkway, some of them are not just alleyway, you can also go up and look at the Slender Lake. Uh, it became an organizing um, network, zone, guide the circulation, also define and wrap the buildings within. Um, and the fire department, to my surprise, said, huh, this could be an interesting phenomena, even though we have a lot of opening. Um, so I wasn't sure what he was talking about, but you know, you just agree. So we extracted the elements from the vernacular typology uh, seen in, in the, the garden that we saw, but also created something what we think is entirely contemporary, something belonging just to this place and to a certain extent this particular project. You see the adjacent pool and the waterway it became part of that landscape. Uh, this was just when it's construction right now, it's completely filled with uh, verdant uh, vegetation. So many of the building roof lines, some of them just sort of slightly above the height of the wall, just low enough so that they are not visible from the outside the compound. So this is where you arrive. Um, and there's, there's theaters. Um, there's also a water garden, a bamboo garden, uh, walkways with reclaimed bricks. Uh, you can walk around the site using the pathway to discover your rooms. Uh, once within, there's a clear separation between the building and the walls, a layering of privacy, and a sliver of landscape for guests to enjoy. Other courtyards are unoccupied, uh, pockets of lush garden to offer relief from the sense of enclosure. You could also, as I said, use this journey to go up the walls. Uh, you mark your experience by engaging with the var var varying sight lines sensing different kinds of horizon. This is also a point where you can actually see the Slender Lake. Uh, the reception court, uh, this is where you check in. The interior of the um, check-in counter and where all the furnitures were built by us. You can notice uh, if some of you are into furniture, I know some of you were asking me if I was gonna do furniture, I'm gonna show you one. Um, this is a little bit thicker than the normal near and who uh, furniture. Uh, because we had to have the local uh, craft uh, do it. Uh, the client refused to buy any imported uh, furniture, which was fine by us, uh, but we had a lot of fight doing this. Um, the private courtyard from a bedroom suite. As we said, we customized all the furniture uh, pieces, um, multidisciplinary in nature. It's not just a buzzword in our practice. <laughs> we actually do it. Um, sometimes maybe a little too crazy. Um. This project was first inspired by the traditional alleyways and courtyards found in the vernacular past, with some careful rethinking about the retreat program and the movement of the guests between rooms, landscape, and common facilities. Here we work with a non-urban site where the existing buildings were mostly demolished, but these buildings left their ghost footprints. So the design came from a reworking of these found imprints. How can we use them to recast a new vernacular? A new vernacular that can speak about this particular place. We sought for this recasting to service new function for future use, but still retain the nuanced sensibility so in intrinsic to Yangzhou's heritage and the way of living and the life that they're used to. The recycled bricks collected from Yangzhou and surrounding villages, five of them to be exact, are reassembled on site as pathways connecting them as courtyards and buildings. By dispersing reclaimed materials, the act of destruction of another relic becomes part of the new building and gives newfound relevance to what was once cast and discarded as construction waste. Dispersion in this project also applies to its spatial organization since all the courtyard spaces are scattered within the matrix of the grid of walls. 
the spaces are themselves dispersed and not contained, creating a garden or landscape approach where the visitors experience unfolding vignettes that recur episodically throughout their journey. Threshold in this particular case and in these projects are less defined. Boundaries are less clear, blurring the line between old and new. It's also fascinating. Every time I visit this place, obviously they've changed m many of um, parts of the architecture and as architects we have to live with it. I still get upset, but uh, I would see old ladies that would walk around this particular ho hotel because it's open to the public and they would say, this brick is from my hometown. Or a, lay, uh, a brick uh, layer says, I laid that brick. Um, it, it's very interesting, they can tell because of the marking of the bricks. So in many ways, this is more than just a hotel. This is a place in which uh, five different village came together and using all the discarded construction waste or materials that's already been demolished or thrown away, seemingly on the side, now being reassembled and put together uh, as, as a destination, as a place that they're all proud of. And the client uh, had hired five, six, six other architects, uh, three Japanese and three Chinese, um, to do exactly the same idea on many different other sites. Um, in fact, Su Fujimoto's uh, project is under construction. Uh, so is Junius Ishigami's uh, project, uh, which is quite interesting uh, in itself. Um, and so he's really quite a visionary in that he understands the importance of revitalizing uh, the rural condition. Um, otherwise, uh, he argues um, many of the artifacts or what China considered um, important relics, 80% of them are in the rural area. And yet the concentration of restoration is in the urban setting. And he argues that actually should be turned around. And by doing so, he also argues that you bring back many of the city dwellers that are taxi drivers uh, or maids uh, that are actually good farmers or bricklayers to come back to where they belong, pay them right, and be with their children. And so in many ways for us, this project is more than just architecture. It became um, a, a social um, uh, agenda for us, um, become quite interesting, because at one point we were not very interested in rural projects, not because um, we didn't think they have potentials, but we just thought they were too far away, the fees were too low, and um, they can't read working drawings. Uh, they would always just look at um, perspectives. And some of you that have practice, um, I am sure, Charles, you know that. Some of practice in China, they just want to see working drawings, you know? Like, let me look at your working drawing. I'll build from working drawing, uh, which is kind of sad. On that note, he's about to close the door. So I think the film is ending. So I'm going to go to the next one, because I think maybe I want to introduce you to my partner. This is where Rosanna comes in. I want to show you a product. So I show you three architectural product. I'll show you a small, small uh, um, project that we did with wallpaper, um, and then I'll show you three other projects. I hope you guys are not hungry. It's the first time we worked with the um, auto industry to uh, develop a product, and we wanted to have a product that has the aspect of you know high tech and using carbon fiber and exploring the limits of that material through its structure qualities. The product is um, a picnic basket for someone who might drive a Jaguar on a weekend to a park. When we were asked to do this project, um, we had to think of a number of things. One was Jaguar and its relevant. Jaguar was the sponsor. Being uh, so naturally the picnic Just so you know, I'm not saying that it's the best car, being Chinese but designers on for this video, yes, it is. That somewhat relate uh, to the context where we practice. So we thought, what would be something similar to a picnic basket in a Chinese context? So we thought of Dandang, which is a lunch box. It's interesting because we were trying to also create an object that would be incorporated into Jaguar. And since the interior of the Jaguar is already so perfect, we thought a picnic basket would be a great addition. 
from a tea set to a So we designed all those uh, pieces as well. Uh, this was when we, when we went to China, we didn't really have projects. So these were our first few projects. Zisa, um, which is a purple clay. Um, actually, it's sold in MoMA, quite interestingly enough. Um, so we, we design a lot of these small objects because no one wants to give us architecture, even interiors. Okay, so the next project uh, is called the Void Aranya Art Center, about three hours east of Beijing uh, in a place called Qinghuangdao. Uh, it's a seaside resort community. Many of you that have followed works uh, by young Chinese architects, I'm actually not so young, it's, they're my age really, but I'm gonna say they're young. Um, people like uh, Li Hu, who's actually from Rice, right? Open architecture. Uh, or Vector, Dong Kong. Um, they have many projects in this particular area, and this uh, developer have a fascination uh, of hiring architects to do cultural projects. So his argument is, if I build 95% of my housing and 5% by architects that would do cultural uh, projects, then the attention, it will have amazing media attention. And also at the same time, people will buy to these towns because there are cultural component to it. So I was really excited, you can imagine, because um, if you know the lonely uh, library by Dong Kong uh, or the chapel, uh, they're all very nice with a beach, uh, with a beach in front of you and um, Li Hu's uh, or open architecture and Huang Wenqing's uh, museum is also kind of dug down. And so I was saying, wow, I, this is an amazing opportunity. Boy, was I wrong. Uh, so when he called me, he's like, well, fly over. And then he showed me this. I was like, where's my beach? Um, did my mic just go off? It's okay, no worries. I have a, I have a baritone voice. Um, so I quickly realized that the site was actually in this um, middle of uh, uh, development. And what was worse was he says, don't you think my Mediterranean village is beautiful? And so he says, I want you to do a museum in this Mediterranean village. And um, even though he was a visionary developer, uh, you can kind of imagine this faux disnification uh, of a city or a town. Uh, so we decided, well, you know what? If I don't have my landscape, I might as well use, uh, create one. Uh, so the use of a primitive geometry is, um, was thought this, oh, I thought of kind of carving my own landscape. And you can kind of see the beach, actually those, those are all the new buildings. Uh, so we took the opportunity to question the notion uh, of space for art versus communal space. We questioned the idea of what this urban artifact should be in a fake Mediterranean community. We decide, why not? Why don't we just celebrate the landscape? How do we do this? So um, some of the original sketches showing the intent of creating an atrium looking to the sky and filling the courtyard with a body of water. Um, Obviously, we have to maximize the footprint. Um, here, we carve out a pure cono uh, conical geometry at the center with a stepping amphitheater at the base. Um, so these are composed primarily of uh, cast uh, concrete, some of them with aggregate as their base. Uh, quite interestingly enough, uh, we create custom um, um, bronze detail and lighting fixtures and signage just to break the scale. Uh, this is where you enter. Uh, within the thick mass of the building, volume is a series of interlocking spaces that visitors can meander freely within. Um, a spiraling path leads you through all the spaces, urging you onwards by the desire to see more. Um, these are the central atrium. The gallery space that allow you to enjoy the art at moments also take your view upwards towards the sky. Above and beyond the functional aspect of art viewing, we see the space as the core of this project, which is the center pool area that gathers the community for concert dramas and other functions of gathering. When it doesn't happen, this is filled with water. Um, very much actually inspired by 
the hotel designed by Lagoretta in 1965 with the water waves. Um, and it, this does work, uh, quite interesting. Um, let me just show you. The central void space can be reconfigured and used in many ways, as I said. A water feature when filled with water, but also a functional performance in a gathering space when the water is drained. Borrowing from Martin Heidegger's seminal text, Building Dwelling Thinking, the boundary is not a point of termination, but a point where presencing begins. Rooted in the notion of contrast, many of our projects use opposition to heighten and reveal the dialectics of inside, outside, and part to whole. The notion of absence or void for us can be understood in relation to a Chinese concept of roinophilia. Unlike European ruins, ancient Chinese structures were often constructed out of wood, leaving behind only their foundations as traces of their original grandeur. Evident in its etymology, the word of ruin which evolved, as I said, from Cho connoting a mound of rubble to Xu, a signifier of emptiness, indicates that over time the concept of this architectural ruin was increasingly freed from the external visual signs, relying on allusion rather than direct little representation. Which brings me to this chapel, which deals with presence as opposed to absence. Uh, this is about an hour and a half away from Shanghai, uh, in a place uh, in Jiangnan, uh, literally means south of the Yang, Yang, Yangtze River. Um, it is next to a famous scenic lake. For some of those are foodies, uh, this is where most of the hairy crab uh, are um, gleaned upon during September months. So if you want to come to Shanghai and visit our office, come in September. So this building is a little bit blurry, but uh, this is the only image I could get this morning, so I quickly uh, put a site plan. Uh, this was actually a village here, uh, and the client um, recreated a broken village uh, to appease the government. Uh, obviously, the housing uh, up above is by uh, Yong Ho Chang, who's also, who came to Rice as well. I think he taught at Rice. Um, and um, Calvin Chow and Macau did the hotel, and we were asked to do the smaller houses. And when the chapel came to play um, uh, for the briefing, um, I was surprised no architects uh, was very interested in doing it because of the tight government regulation, uh, especially with the religion department. Uh, that that kind of surprised me because uh, 20 firms were asked uh, to bid for this lighthouse, this. Uh, uh, certified, actually, it's a church that's allowable to worship. Um, there's a lot of underground churches uh, in China, if you haven't been. Uh, but this is one of four that's legal. But I would, to my surprise, all 19 firms turned it down. We were the only one that's like, yeah, we'll do it. Um, and then I realized how difficult it was. Um, so we had, in, in our planning presentation, actually had to rely on this drawing from Wu Guangzong, um, some of you might uh, know the, his work, um, to convince the religion department that we're interested in the artistic endeavor of Chinese history. A painterly re rendition of a particular kind of vernacular sublime. Maybe this was a little stretch, but it worked. Characteristic of the white walls and gray clay tiles found in the Jiangnan water towns. Interestingly, this artist has modernized the traditional ink brush strokes with watercolor, creating a new way of representation not seen before. So we were looking at the ins this integration of ink brush with watercolor, marveling at the sensibility of this new medium against the old ink tradition, and wanted to see how, through architecture, we can find a unique articulation for such kind of representation. So the chapel was uh, very simple. Uh, that was a brief. Uh, it needs to be a lantern uh, for this little village. Uh, but at the same time, it needed to provide another space that is of equal value as the chapel itself. That was the religion's department's requirement and confined within the FAR that was given to us. So we said to ourselves, why don't we use the stairway that leads you up to the roof garden as that other space? Uh, and to have that other space engage uh, with uh, the chapel itself. Uh, again, the walls were made from reclaimed bricks uh, starting with refined scale where different heights interweave to create a choreograph landscape journey and the pattern starts to uh, have a di different form as it enters towards uh, the sanctuary. 
very simple form, plan-wise, with a stairway. We widened the stairway uh, and made that space a public space uh, to appease uh, the religion department. So adjacent to the 12-meter chapel is this prominent staircase. Uh, in, in our presentation, obviously, we call it um, the stairway uh, to the garden, the stairway to heaven, um, and they're like, okay, um, the stairway to nature. Um, you, you have to do many of these things because arg they argue that many of the younger generation might be intimidated and therefore this space would not be relevant. So this side stairway became our obsession. Uh, it threw a different kind of journey from the ground to the roof. In fact, a lot of the budget was placed in here. But this rich sensorial experience, the play of light and shadow, the sound from the chapel is heard from, from um, when you're in this um, uh, stairway. Um, and yet, you know, you're hidden from the crowd. Um, you, you threw um, sort of glimpses of the chapel. Um, you can assimilate yourself. Um, and if the chapel is to congregate here, is to isolate a sense of contemplation, perhaps. So this journey also leads you to the mezzanine, uh, where the mezzanine level hovers ahead to accommodate extra guests and includes a catwalk encircling the space, allowing the uh, 360 degrees of viewing angles. Um, the pews uh, were also custom made by our office. Um, let me show you. So from the back of the mezzanine, you could also go out uh, to here to be able to see the lake beyond, um, to gain a view of the whole village. Tectonically, the white volume is uh, specially treated with two layers of exterior. The inner layer, a simple concrete box punctuated on all sides with scattered windows. The outer layer is a folded and perforated metal skin a veil, if you will, that alternatively hides and reveals. So the filmmaker hates it when I do this, but I have to do it because of time. So the last project takes a similar approach to using incision and stitching as formal strategies, but yielding a very different result. Uh, we are in the south of China, uh, in a place called Nantou in Shenzhen. 
Uh, Shenzhen is known as a city without a history, uh, but there is a vibrant urban village uh, where this is situated. Uh, that image is interesting because this used to be the central business district, or Nantou used to be the most vibrant, and you can kind of see the, the business district have moved up where the towers are. Uh, and it's interestingly enough, all the towers, you can name all the star architects in there. Uh, Bjarke Ingels, OMA, and it just the roll call comes in. Uh, of course, we would never be given an opportunity to do a high rise, uh, probably not good at it anyways. But um, so we were given, um, Wang Ke decided to take over this old village because it realized that it had this opportunity wherein they would rent from the owners, um, dilapidated building and renovate them and um, rent it for 12 years. And so they took over this little village, 300 buildings altogether. And they decided that perhaps out of that 300, 12 of them will not be retail or entertainment, but 12 will be a little bit more on the cultural side, uh, be it um, uh, um, museum uh, or a theater. Um, so firms like MVRDV uh, did this uh, a beautiful uh, cultural kind of um, we work kind of space. It's not we work, but it's a co-working space for the community. Uh, Yongho is doing a little theater. Uh, Sejima is doing this garden um, with, with uh, a small outdoor theater. Um, the Vietnamese architect Vo Trong was asked to do uh, um, um, a huge canopy uh, that leads to a series of housing uh, project. Uh, and we were asked to do a hotel. Um, so characters like winding alleys, uh, hidden corners, dead ends, narrow gaps between buildings um, are prevalent uh, in this uh, particular um, area. And you see the, all these uh, were redeveloped. Uh, taken. In fact, this was quite controversial uh, of a project because at one point um, in um, the Herald Tribune in um, London, they questioned the authenticity of Wonka's developer's motive. Um, so we were to intervene on an eight-story tall existing building, um, which is that yellow building, and to transform it into an 11 a uh, room guest house, uh, also a place where Wonka can host their guests and talk about their vision of community. Um, and so you can see that yellow building, small tiles, uh, small bathroom tiles. Um, so here, um, another notion of ruin by Svetlana Boim came to play. Um, something entirely fresh uh, became quite useful for us, uh, this idea of of modern ruins, uh, not only being a symptom, but also sites for new exploration and production of meaning, and that this idea of plural modernities and the idea of disharmony might be a possibility. Uh, so we were reminded of Mata Clark, both his canonical intersect in 1975 from the Paris Biennale and the splitting in Inglewood, New Jersey in 1974. Uh, in Paris, he used a radical incision to critique urban development and the public role of art. Um, he created the void to offer a, view, offer a view of the structure's internal skeletons, thereby protesting the demolition in the Le Halles area. Um, in the splitting project uh, to uh, the right, he wanted to convert this building into an internalized state of mind. This resonated with a Chinese notion of ruin for us, actually, something internalized and absent. So this was that existing building. Um, so what we did was we actually kept the uh, tile uh, condition. Uh, and what we did was we patched it with concrete when um, we needed to, and we created a veil around it. Uh, two entrances to the guest house. Uh, one is by, through this alleyway um, from a street uh, to the main entrance, uh, opening to the public pia uh, plaza. Uh, from the cafe inside, you see the two entries. Uh, again, a lot of the custom-made furniture. Um, where the alleyway went, winds its way around the corner, uh, we created this particular stone bench, which was the demarcation uh, of the owner's um, 
plot uh, for this building and he made sure that we uh, celebrated this. Uh, so we said, why don't we make it a community um, place as well. So arriving through the alleyways, the public gesture of opening up the building uh, by literally cutting this um, building up along the urban axis. Uh, we then move up uh, upward by inserting a new set of stairway that previously connected all nine uh, of the tenement floors. Uh, have this vertical incision that allows natural elements to pass through. Uh, this is the exploded axon. Uh, to celebrate life in the urban village, the existing structure was not only cut into the massing strategy, but also used as a way to connect different rooms, allowing such urban incision to foster a new public realm on the inside the previously private apartment block. The contrast and tension between old and new, past and present are very much part of the spatial and sectional experience uh, of this project. Old and new are juxtaposed throughout the building to celebrate ruins, not just as symbols or reminders of the past, but following Boehm's assertion that ruins can take on a different logic, which is not romantic, not baroque, not melancholic, but a form of toleration of disharmony. Uh, we went really crazy on this. We actually made custom bathtub. We had Agape uh, uh, Casa did this. Um, deep tub that you only see in Japanese and Chinese bathing culture when it's actually really small but rather tall, you actually can sit on it um, or immerse yourself. Um, so the stairway functions like the hanging walkways in a traditional Chinese kuzan, uh, which means rest stop in or public and intimate programs. The door opens up halfway so the breeze, uh, sunsun is really hot, can open. You know how hotels are if you go to China. Uh, a lot of people in the walkway, you actually hear people talk because they just open their door. Uh, and They just inhabit the public space. So we said, why don't we just do that for you? Um, so within the stairway, weather-treated steel doors and wall panels have been inserted. And you see like the bustling alleyways below, the roofscape across Nanto has a life of its own with makeshift gardens and vegetable farms popping up along the jagged skyline. So I'm gonna go next. This is a special um, project for us because this is the first film where in my, actually my son did this uh, for us. This is the first collaboration uh, and he was very difficult to work with. Because I said, where's my building? He's like, well, if you follow your narrative, then the community is more important. So your building is not that important. So stitch and incision, uh, both surgical in nature, speak to Nairn, whose archaeological approach of peeling back the layers. As I said, in the spirit of Gordon Mata Clark, whose self-described work are about making space without building it, Nairn, whose project expressed techniques of erosion and erasure, calibrated to produce a new unexpected spatial readings. Remnants are woven together by recomposing an assemblage of found fragments to unify the past and unify these different parts that we have found in the site. In Mata Clark's works, the buildings are the bodies upon which acts of disruption, deconstruction, and deletion are enacted to alter one's spatial orientation. Viewing between the gaps, fissures, and board apertures, the visitor suddenly gains a newfound awareness of the precarious relationship between rooms chambers and urban context. In contrast, the act of stitching requires a more labored effort. Stitching demands a certain finesse where alignments and precision de determines its success. Sarah Whiting's challenges, challenges the term adaptive reuse in the article she wrote on our projects in Domus Magazine, offering another term, seamless synthesis as her preference to mean something that unlocks intellectual horizons and other worlds with particular magical precision. Perhaps this quiet synthesis that she talks about is not meant to mass or destruct, but neither is it meant to call attention to itself. Hopefully with this and the other projects that I have shown today, which cross divides between the past and the future, between typologies, between locations and cultures, between tradition, design practice, and alternative programs and functions, we were able to bring forth new meanings to architecture by its ability to construct new relationship and borrowing from Terence Hawke's words, perceive those that are between them. 
perhaps it is the marginal spaces, the in-between, the third spaces that Homi Baba talks about that we find new meaning and purpose in architecture. As the French philosopher once said, we do not aspire to be eternal beings. We only hope things do not lose its meaning and purpose. Thank you. <laughs>